5G isn't the end of the line. In fact, it's just the warm up. What comes next will completely flip how we connect, compute, and experience the digital world. And here is the catch most people have no idea what's already being built. This isn't just about faster downloads, it's about new infrastructure that could blur the line between the internet and the reality. The question isn't whether we are ready for it, the question is, who is controlling what's coming next? Let's get one thing straight. The conversation about what comes after 5G is not about bumping up your signal bars. It's about redefining how wireless systems function at the most basic level. We're talking about 6G, but the number doesn't capture what's really happening. If 5G was about connecting more devices faster, 6G is about creating intelligence at the edge of the network. Imagine if the network itself could understand what you need before you even ask. That's the direction this is heading. 6G is still in development, but countries and corporations are already fighting over it. The race is on. The US, China, the EU, South Korea, and Japan are all throwing resources into labs, test beds, and pilot projects. And the goal isn't just better performance. It's about control. Whoever builds and patents the foundational tech behind 6G will shape the global digital ecosystem for the next 30 years. Right now, the conversation centers on what's called terahertz frequencies. 5G expanded into the millimeter wave band. 6G is looking to go even further up the spectrum. That unlocks huge bandwidth potential but comes with trade-offs. These frequencies can carry massive amounts of data, but they don't travel far and they don't penetrate walls well. So if you want 6G to work, you need dense networks of micro-base stations, reconfigurable surface on buildings, smart materials that bounce signals, and intelligent routing systems that adapt in real time. It's not just an upgrade, it's a full rebuild. And that's where the second big difference comes in. With 5G, you need more towers. With 6G, the infrastructure might become invisible. Think of intelligent fabrics, AI-enhanced signal relays embedded in your env environment, and devices that not only send and receive data, but collaborate with each other to process it. Phones might not be the central hub anymore. The network becomes the brain. Your devices become the senses. Let's talk latency. 5G brought it down to about one millisecond. This was already a game changer for things like gaming, autonomous driving, and robotic surgery. But 6G is targeting latency in the microsecond range. That's a thousand times faster. At that level, you are getting close to what your own nervous system can do. That opens the door to things like real-time holographic communication. Not just video calls, but virtual presence. And that's not some sci-fi leap. The prototypes are already being tested in universities and labs. If the infrastructure can support it, your next meeting could involve full body avatars interacting in shared digital space with zero lag. There is another key shift, intelligence, not just speed. 6G is being built with AI baked into the architecture. Right now, AI sits on top of networks. You ask your assistant something, it queries the cloud, the data comes back. With 6G, AI will be running inside the network. That means decision making at the speed of signal transmission. The network can optimize itself, predict what needs to be sent where, and even deny or reroute data based on context, threat level, and our usage patterns. This will change security too. Right now, data has to be sent to a centralized server for inspection, filtering, and threat detection. In a 6G world, threat detection can happen at the point of contact. That means faster responses to cyber attacks, but it also means the network gets a lot more power over the data. The implications go deep because if you are not just sending data, but making decisions with it in real time at the edge, then the boundary between device, network, and user starts to disappear. The system starts to feel like one big organism, and that organism is being shaped by the companies and governments building it right now. This isn't just a tech story, it's a geopolitics story. Who builds the 6G standards will control the devices, 
the patents, the royalties, and the leverage that comes with it. Right now, China is already trying to dominate the patent race. The US is trying to counter that with Next G Alliance. Europe has Hexa X. South Korea has its own roadmap. Each of these initiatives is trying to define what 6G will be. And here is what no one is really talking about. These systems aren't just about communication, they are about perception. What gets prioritized, what gets blocked, what gets processed where. Once that power is embedded in the infrastructure, it becomes almost impossible to challenge because the rules won't be written in laws. They will be written in code and silicon. This is the moment before the lock-in. Once the hardware is built, once the standards are adopted, you can't easily switch. And that's why there is so much urgency right now. It's not about preparing for the future. It's about deciding what kind of future gets built and who gets to own it. What makes 6G radically different isn't just the faster data or lower latency. It is the fact that the network itself is being designed to act more like a living brain than a communication pipeline. 6G will be aware. It's, it will sense. It will predict. It will even react before you know you need something. That's not a tagline. That's the real ambition behind this next generation. The engineers building 6G aren't just upgrading antennas. They are wiring cognition into the fabric of the network. Let's break that down. Today, your phone connects to a tower. The tower connects to a data center. And a bunch of servers decide what happens next. There is distance. There is lag. There is a clear separation between user, device, and cloud. 6G collapses those divisions the processing power gets pushed closer to you, not just geographically, functionally. It means computation, decision-making, and even artificial intelligence are being embedded everywhere. In your streetlights, your walls, your clothes, your car seats, your city infrastructure, this isn't hypothetical. It's already being tested. Engineers are working on ambient intelligent surfaces, materials that can manipulate radio waves in real time. You put that coating on a building and it becomes a smart signal reflector. You add it to your home and suddenly your wall is part of your communication network. These aren't passive tools. They can be programmed. They can detect presence, optimize signal flow, and filter interference. The environment becomes active. And once the environment becomes active, so does the potential for sensing. 6G isn't just about transmitting your voice or video. It's about capturing your gestures, your temperature, your position in space, not through cameras, but through what's being called integrated sensing and communication, or ISAC. Basically, the same radio waves used for data transmission can also be used to map the physical world around you. The same signal that sends your message can also scan your posture, detect your heart rate, and track nearby movement with radar level accuracy. That unlocks insane new capabilities. Imagine walking into your room and the network knows you are there, not through login credentials, but through signal reflection patterns. Your location, your movement, even your emotions could be interpreted by the system. That's what 6G is aiming for, a network that knows the shape of the world it lives in. And when you layer AI into this, things start to get weird. Because now the network doesn't just detect, it understands patterns. It learns preferences. It starts to optimize itself based on behavior. If you usually take calls at a certain time in a certain place, it can reserve bandwidth for you before you ask. If your factory floor has an unusual vibration signature, it can flag it instantly. This is infrastructure that adapts without human input. It goes further. The vision for 6G includes digital twins of people and environments. That means real-time virtual replicas of physical spaces and individuals that can be monitored, trained, and even predicted. A hospital could have a full virtual model of a patient updated second by second through wireless sensors. 
A city could simulate traffic flows with real-time feedback loops from every vehicle, every pedestrian, every building sensor. These aren't just tools for control, they are tools for simulation. The future could be run in parallel, physically and virtually at the same time. But there is a twist. All of this depends on edge computing. You can't send petabytes of sensing data to the cloud and wait for instructions. You need tiny, fast processors everywhere. You need a distributed intelligence. That's why chip makers are already working on ultra low power AI chips that can run in your shoes, your glasses, your car mirror. These chips don't need to talk to a supercomputer. They are the supercomputer on a microscopic scale. 6G is where connectivity meets perception, but perception has implications. If the network sees everything, who owns that visibility? Who decides what gets remembered, what gets erased, what gets monetized? These aren't tech questions, they are governance questions. Because in a 6G world, data isn't just collected, it's interpreted scored and acted on automatically. That's a huge shift in power. Think about how that plays out in cities. A smart crosswalk could know exactly when someone is approaching and adjust traffic in real time. But what if it doesn't recognize you? What if your profile is tagged as a low priority? What if your data is missing or misclassified? BIOS isn't just a glitch in a spreadsheet anymore. It becomes embedded in the rules of physical movement, of access, of participation. And once that system becomes normalized, opt-out stops being an option. If buildings, streets, and devices are all network aware, then being offline becomes equivalent to being invisible. Privacy isn't just about your phone settings anymore. It's about your spatial existence. That's why discussions about what comes after 5G can't be left to engineers alone. The real battleground is about how these networks are designed to think and who gets to teach them how to think. Because unlike previous generations, 6G doesn't just move information. It makes decisions every second, billions of them per user, per system, per sensor. And all of that is being mapped, coded, and standardized now. Not in some distant future, but in conferences and consortia today. So when the switch flips and the network goes live, the behavior will already be baked in. The values, the priorities, the blind spots, they won't come from public debate. They will come from architecture, from the invisible lines of code that shape how the system sees and acts. That's why this moment matters. We're not just watching the next G. We are watching the next layer of human society being scaffolded in real time. And the people setting the scaffolding may not even realize what they're building. Here is where things start to feel less like a network upgrade and more like a change in how we live. If 6G fulfills even half of its ambition, then the idea of a device as a thing you carry around could start to vanish. The phone in your pocket, the laptop on your desk, even the variables on your wrist, those could become optional. Not absolute, but optional. Because what we are really building isn't just faster wireless. It's an ambient internet, an internet that's just there, like air, like electricity, always on, always sensing, always serving. Let's say you walk into your workspace. You don't log in. You don't open your laptop. You speak, you move, you gesture, and the environment responds. The lights adjust, the screen appears, the network knows your voice, your habits, your context. Your digital identity isn't locked inside a password-protected device. It's distributed across the space. And that's not fantasy. That's the goal. 6G will make the network itself the interface. Think of it like this. Right now, you ask your phone to do something. With, with 6G, the network asks itself what you are trying to do and just does it. It's anticipatory not reactive. You stop having to initiate actions. The system becomes proactive, predictive, context-aware. 
your environment becomes personalized without you lifting a finger. That's what people mean when they talk about zero latency experiences. Not just technically low latency, but psychologically invisible. You don't notice the interface anymore because it's melted into the world. And when that happens, the power dynamic shifts again. Because now, it's not just what you see or tap. It's what the system thinks you want, what it predicts you will do, what it chooses to surface or hide. This raises huge questions about autonomy. If the system is guiding your choices before you even make them, are they still your choices? If the network decides what's sufficient, what's safe, what's optimal, where does your intent fit into that? These are the kinds of philosophical questions that get brushed aside during tech rollouts. But they are going to hit hard when the experience of reality starts to feel different, depending on who you are and how the network has profiled you. And let's talk about economics, because there is a reason the biggest players in telecom, AI, and cloud computing are investing in this future. A network that predicts is a network that sells. Your data is no longer just used to targeted ads. It's used to shape the timing, format, and context of every service you experience. Advertising fades, nudging takes over. Instead of seeing an ad for shoes, the network might notice your gait has changed and prompt a personalized offer for insoles before you notice discomfort. That's hypercapitalism at a level we haven't experienced yet. Not just personalization, but preemptive intervention. Not just selling based on what you do, but shaping what you do in the first place. The economic incentive is enormous. Whoever builds this ambient internet stands to profit not just from bandwidth, but from behavior, from orchestrating what people need before they know they need it. And if that sounds dystopian, it's because it could be, not inherently, but be designed. If the default setting is always on surveillance in exchange for seamless convenience, how do we opt out without being left behind? What happens when participating in the economy, in society, in daily life requires immersion in a network you don't control? These are questions that need answering before the rollout. Not after, because once 6G goes live, Rewiring the system won't be easy. The standards being drafted now will define the rules of the game for decades. And those rules are being set by a small circle of tech companies, telecom giants, and government bodies, most of whom are more focused on speed, performance, and profits than long-term social impacts. But there is still time. Right now, 6G is in the research and standardization phase. The window for influence is open. This is when the architecture gets sketched out, when the core assumptions are baked into the protocols, and those assumptions matter. They determine how much control you will have over your data, how transparent the system will be, how fair access is distributed, and whether the future serves the public or just a handful of powerful players. Some people are calling for a new kind of digital bill of rights, one that built into the infrastructure itself, privacy by design, transparency by default, distributed ownership of data and identity. These aren't just ideals, they are design decisions. And the next generation of the internet is the last chance to get them right before the structure becomes too embedded to change. What comes after 5G isn't just another number, it's a fork in the road. One path leads to a world of frictionless intelligence where your environment adapts to your needs in real time. The other leads to an invisible cage, predictable, efficient, but certainly controlling. Both outcomes are possible, both are already being built. And the difference between them won't come from better tech. It will come from better choices, better oversight, better public conversation, because this isn't just a question of what's possible. It's a question of what kind of digital future we are willing to live in. Thanks for watching.